welcome uh, everyone. Looks like uh, we are good to get started. Would like to uh, welcome everyone. Um, this group is either currently or formerly from uh, Simon Fraser University. Um, all of us are at some in some way affiliated or were affiliated. Um, I am um, a currently a, an associate professor in the School of Criminology, and I uh, run the International Cybercrime Research Center. Uh, Barry Cartwright, uh, who's also here, uh, was um, a faculty member who retired uh, a couple of years ago, I think, and uh, is uh, the associate director of the International Cybercrime Research Center. Uh, Cormier, um, you're currently a PhD student at the University of Waterloo, uh, formerly from SFU Criminology, ICCRC, and Sarah May is also formerly from the ICCRC and the School of Criminology. We have uh, four presentations in total, uh, two which will go from uh, now until the uh, end of the hour. Uh, we'll focus on uh, misinformation, disinformation, and then uh, we'll um, switch it up a bit and I will do introductions at that point again. So we'll have two presentations. Uh, the first, uh, Carmier and uh, Sarah May will present on um, this, well, uh, on one aspect of uh, a project that we did, after which I will present um, on a different angle on the same project. So these two presentations are linked. Uh, they are coming from the exact same project, just uh, very different uh, portions of it. And um, after the two presentations, we'll do questions and answers. So um, I'm done. Thank you, Carmier, Sarah May. Thank you, Dr. Frank. And let's start. Hello, everyone. Uh, again, thank you, Richard, for the introduction. So my name is Karan Beer, and we'll be presenting on thematic analysis of the major disinformation narratives and discursive techniques employed by Russian, Chinese, and Iranian operatives. And we'll provide, um, in this project, we'll provide a Canadian viewpoint to it. Um. Um, so in this research paper, we explored the major themes, narratives, and discursive practices in disinformation campaigns mounted on social media and online news sites by China, Russia, and Iran. Um, we identified similarities, dissimilarities, continuities, and discontinuities in their effort to disrupt democratic institutions and sow dissent and distrust within the targeted population. Um, so um, before we dive into the, the findings and what we did for our project, I'll um, go over a little bit of the um, how we operationalize our terminology. So uh, for this project, um, for real information, we um, use the definition from Bergel, which defines as real information uh, as something that is factual, whereas the accuracy of the statement could be confirmed through other reputable um, sources. Mis misinformation as misleading or false information, which uh, might be shared by um, unwittingly by individuals who genuinely believe that information is true. And lastly, disinformation uh, involves the malicious and purposeful creation and dissemination of information that is known to be untrue. So while a foreign arrangement is not essential in this, foreign adversaries um, often um, involved. And foreign actors may disguise their interference by creating the impression that is originated from civilian-based domestic groups. Disinformation can create a threat to democracy. So hostile disinformation campaigns often seek to create discord, polarization, hatred, and violence amongst the nation's citizenry taking advantage of and propagating existing prejudices, divisions, and injustices. A big point to make here is that while it focuses on polarization, the harm created is not equal. These disinformation efforts encourage hatred against marginalized populations, making them targets of violence. This is where we see a lot of disinformation encouraging hatred against marginalized groups. For instance, right now we are seeing a huge rise worldwide really in hatred against the transgender community that is creating a threat to their safety. Some of this is pushed and used by disinformation campaigns. Foreign disinformation can be a tool for radicalization, especially in fomenting right-wing extremism. 
And additionally, research tends to find that right-wing individuals are more susceptible to being manipulated by disinformation. Looking at the Canadian context, the Russian IRA, the Internet Research Agency, which is sort of an infamous purveyor of state-sponsored disinformation, they've disseminated disinformation on Canadian social media, especially espousing anti-Trudeau, anti-liberal tropes, and promoting more conservative political figures. Um, we see also Russia promoting a lot of kind of anti-immigrant and anti-LGBTQ narratives on Canadian social media. Iran, we know, has targeted the 2015 federal election in Canada, as well as attacking Canada's oil industry by sometimes amplifying genuine tweets from Canadians who are opposed to oil extraction and pipeline construction. Additionally, China, as we will discuss, and as is currently very prominent in political discussion, has done some actions of foreign interference within Canada and worldwide in recent times. Um, so our methodology for this project, so after conducting an in-depth review of the extent literature and creating a list of previous and present uh, hostile influence activities from which we could reliably extract in disinformation and misinformation, we set out to identify suitable online sources of real information, misinformation, and disinformation from which the team could scrape the data or otherwise obtain large representative data sets. Um, members of the team worked together previously on a couple of other disinformation warfare projects, and thus we were a little bit more acquainted uh, with the typology of um, online disinformation and misinformation what they could look like and where we could search the terms and how we could um, um, take the data. So all um, three were purpose examples um, drawn for a specific um, my, um, reason in mind um, for a purpose, uh, which was the in-depth analysis of Russian, Chinese, and Iranian online disinformation activities in search of the major themes, narratives, and discursive practices. So the first data set included 3,000 Instagram posts, including 1,000 disinformation posts from Russia and China, pages such as State Council Information Office of the PRC, um, known as um, SCIO, and China um, Global Television Network, CJTN, and Russia's Sputnik News. Uh, 500 domestic misinformation posts were also um, collected, which um, are used so, uh, from pages such as Avoid, um, Avoid Mass Media, Rise Up Canada, and 1,500 real information posts from mainstream news sources like the BBC, CNN, CTV, and Globe and Mail. And second one um, data set that we have is uh, from um, Russian Internet Research Agency, which is the 5,000 uh, five disinformation posts uh, that appeared on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram ranging from pre-2014 through early 2022. And some of our data was made available by Twitter and data collected by um, Dr. Linwell and Walker. And some of the data, um, uh, one of our um, author, um, Dr. Panu um, collected it. And lastly, for contrast, a data set of 1,250 Iranian disinformation tweets were also analyzed. And this data set um, was made available by Twitter. And after cleaning a millions of posts um, from Twitter, the cleaning the clutter um, for our qualitative analysis, we chose um, two random sampled uh, to 1250 tweets. So in our in terms of the analysis process, um, uh, in our preliminary stage, a batches of 500 randomly sampled uh, tweets and messages were coded by separate, um, separately by members of our team um, and who had worked previously on earlier um, uh, uh, disinformation projects. So we um, discussed the findings together, examined the overlap uh, between narratives that we um, came up with and undertook major revisions, and then we came up with our analysis process. And uh, we used Excel, NVO, and SPSS to analyze our data. 
And our intercoder reliability score uh, assimilated between the 96 to 97% mark. So in the initial stages, we identified 13 prominent narratives that appeared with re regularity in the disinformation campaigns uh, of hostile foreign actors. So politicians are incompetent and dishonest was one of the, the theme that we came up, uh, which included discussion on the oft repeated refrains about liberals, Democrats being sick, crazy, too radical, and politicians lying, making mistakes, or just simply being unqualified to hold the office. Uh, world chaos included discussion on like the breakdown of the law, order, political and economic uncertainty. Policy persuasion, which included um, efforts to influence policy in targeted countries. So visa or travel restrictions on source countries are unfair or counterproductive. Um, we also looked at like the West is fa uh, failing, included like discussion on democracy, capitalism failing, pro-Trump, which is just like self-explanatory at this point, included discussion on make America great, Trump rock, like Fox News, Donald rock, the greatness of Donald Trump and his friends. Um, I don't want to go in all of them, but like uh, we had like other categories of denial of human rights. Um, distrust in media, which included discussion on mainstream media as fake news, police brutality, uh, ethnic minorities are threat, which included discussion on Muslims, Black Lives Matter refugees, uh, illegal aliens, undocumented immigrant uh, represents threat to the social uh, fabric, are uh, likely to be more dangerous, and so on. Uh, inequality, discrimination like oppression, unequal access to employment, educational opportunities, members in the minority groups like LGBTQ community. And lastly, glorification of veterans. Um, so include discussion of veterans, military un underappreciated, mistreated, not accorded the same rights as the immigrants or the illegal aliens. And I'll go over the market manipulation and anti-Trump later on because those two categories we added during our uh, Iranian um, data set findings, or sorry, the analysis. So the fun part, uh, our findings. Um, so we'll discuss um, the Instagram data set first. So of the 3,000 Instagram um, posts, um, 1,510 were categorized as real information and consistent with the fact that 1,500 posts were drawn from mainstream or real information sources. And the disinformation attacks and misinformation campaigns sometimes included real information and which could be either intentionally or by chance. Um, while only 1,232 uh, posts were categorized as disinformation or misinformation, this is explained by the fact that 144 posts were categorized as other and 144 um, were classified as unclassified. So because the 50% of our data was coded as real information, so the major narrative was not applicable. Um, but um, we could see here on the screen that source of security where the 16.4% was the highest category with 492 posts. We had distress elite, pro-Trump was in the top five as well, and politicians are incompetent, dishonest uh, with 2.4% or 72 posts. Source of superiority as a narrative was especially popular and prominent amongst disinformation originating from China. This often consisted of promoting the benefits of Chinese influence and painting themselves as a strong nation and generally as a benign power beneficial to the rest of the world. So 85.7% of the messages we categorized as having the narrative source superiority were Chinese. In this quote, for instance, you can see that they discussed themselves as having significantly improved education, health care, et cetera, within Tibet. Another prominent narrative, especially from Russia, was distrust elite. In this case, elite is a very common phrase when we come to more conspiratorial narratives, which Russia especially really takes advantage of. In this case, the elite could be 
the authorities, the government, liberals or scientists. This is a useful narrative because it can be deployed against both the left and the right. As in this quote, where we see mention of scientists potentially being confused, discussion of dangers to the environment, and specific note of a potential danger to indigenous peoples. So our next data set includes the Russian IRA data set, and we'll um, discuss the findings from that. So we analyzed 5,500 suspected Russian IRA disinformation posts that appeared on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, as I mentioned earlier, ranging from the pre-2014 to early 2022. So in particular, uh, particular, we sought to identify the main disinformation narratives, the changes in uh, Russian in disinformation messages over time, and new disinformation narratives that were emerging in regards to the Russia's intention toward Ukraine. Uh, and total of 14 main narratives were identified within the, the data um, collected from 5005 posts. So we saw a higher uh, trend during the 2018-2020 time period about the politicians are incompetent because the 2019 Canadian election, but also um, um, where it like one of the posts talked about it by the Duran um, post attached Canadian politician like uh, Christia Freeland could replace Trudeau question mark out of the frying pan into the fire. So um, basically um, putting um, um, attacking the Canadian um, politicians. And there was more discussion about glorification of veterans, police brutality and denial of human rights uh, in the Russian data set than um, the Instagram data set. And although those three narratives combined accounted for only 2.8% of, of the Russian messaging, but it's still um, one of the findings that we wanted to highlight here. Something we really looked at was changes in Russian disinformation approaches over time. So what we really saw, especially over this time period, was the blurring of foreign and domestic. So we saw a bit of a move from Russia producing disinformation material and posing as citizens of the target uh, nation to Russia doing more amplification of domestic sources, domestic disinformation, misinformation, using members of the target nation as tools. We also saw an emphasis on alternative media and authorities. So in the earlier stages, we saw a lot of posting disinformation that really painted the media and traditional authorities as untrustworthy. Well, now that they have discredited these authorities, they can replace those authorities with new ones. So alternative media and other authorities. And finally, we see them framing the Western elite as the enemy. So first, there was a lot of discussion of minorities, immigrants, etc., as being sort of a threat to safety. And now we really see the elite, the government, etc., being shown as a threat to freedom. And Russia itself being painted as a place where there is freedom. We really need to focus, I think, in the future on some of this, the ways in which Russia is using and possibly linking with these potentially unwitting domestic groups. We also looked at some of the narratives, specifically how they were used when it came to the early period of the invasion of Ukraine. The same narratives can be easily deployed to serve the situation at hand. They are able to be quickly adapted to the current goal. So the general narrative of source superiority, when it came to this goal regarding Ukraine, well, that was about Russia's military strength. And policy persuasion, we saw a move to Russian action being portrayed as justified and the West being shown as the aggressor. Distrust elite. Well, the Western elite want tyranny, and Russia is the land of the free. So next one, um, next data set is the Iranian disinformation data set. 
So as was the case uh, with many of the tweets in the Russian IRA data sets, um, the Iranian data set was obtained by applying uh, or for access through Twitter. And we successfully removed most of the clutter and the randomly and then randomly sampled um, to 1250 tweets from this 40,000 tweet data set. Um, our concerted effort at cleaning or cleansing the data set resulted in 97.1 of these um, 1250 Iranian tweets being classified as disinformation, with only 29 left as unclassified and seven classified as other. The narratives in this data set tended to be quite distinct. So Russian, Russian disinformation tended to be more pro-Trump, while Iranian tended to be more anti-Trump. Thus, you can see both anti-Trump and pro-Trump appearing in our top percentages. This could possibly be, cut, be due to Trump being more vocally anti-Iranian, uh, for instance, suggesting the increased sanctions and making changes to policy in regards to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, etc. When we uh, analyzed this, we did an in vivo analysis. So if we specifically look at the policy persuasion uh, narrative, which was a very common narrative within this data set, we see some of the top results here being when it comes to word count, because that's kind of an interesting analysis we did. We saw the word sanctions a great deal, which makes a lot of sense. Iran trying to convince people that actions against it, such as sanctions, are not wise and not beneficial. We also see messaging regarding Iran's local position and the ongoing efforts for supremacy within the Middle East, North Africa region. For instance, Iran versus Saudi Arabia, a very long standing conflict that often features proxy conflicts, for instance, within Yemen. And we see here messaging about Yemen and the situation there. We also see in discussion of, for instance, Zionism, Hezbollah, etc., use of the decades long conflict within Israel-Palestine, which itself becomes a very popular tool within disinformation. So in conclusion, or in our, our discussion, so our analysis shows that while Russia, China, and Iran may seek to transmit somewhat different messages, sometimes with different objectives in mind, they mostly employ similar narratives and discursive techniques. Um, use of these narratives and techniques in online news and social media were pioneered by Russia. And the Russian social media disinformation remains the template that other nations tend to follow. Um, targets may uh, vary as well. Uh, and while it can be difficult to identify a specific target um, because the messaging is often intended for multiple targets, we observe that organizations to which Canada belongs, uh, including the NATO, the G7, NAFTA, were regular targets. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Conrad and uh, Sarmay. Switching uh, to another perspective on the same project, um, I mentioned uh, that we did a project, and these are two different um, angles on it. Uh, Conrad and Sarmay presented a very qualitative analysis um, for all of the themes that they discovered. Um, and after that was all done, uh, after the data was collected, uh, we then um, tried to apply uh, machine learning algorithms and come create a, um, an artificial intelligence type system that uh, could distinguish between uh, these two types of, um, not, not these two types, uh, but uh, that could distinguish this information from uh, everything else. And that is what this uh, presentation will focus on. Uh, essentially, um, I will discuss uh, 
the data sets, the machine learning algorithms that we applied to them, and uh, the results and how well we can distinguish and detect uh, this type of disinformation. The um, previous presentation covered uh, three uh, countries, essentially disinformation coming from Russia targeting the Brexit referendum and the presidential election. Uh, we also saw um, a lot of uh, disinformation coming out of China targeting Canada and um, coming out of Iran also targeting uh, Canada. For the machine learning process, um, we did our uh, trainings on uh, two different data sets only, uh, the Russian and the Iranian data sets, and that is what I will focus on. The uh, source of the data is um, what was uh, previously discussed. Um, it came from Twitter. They provided us a very large data set, um, millions of records uh, for uh, different disinformation campaigns that they, did, they detected and uh, took down. The qualitative team, um, Barry Sarame and uh, Karmir, um, filtered that content down into a 40,000 uh, tweet data set. And uh, given those time periods and the narratives, um, they then uh, looked for a similar data set uh, coming from trusted news sources. I've listed um, a couple up on the right hand side. So, Rather than just requiring disinformation, uh, we also need an equivalent sample of, of uh, real, reliable information. So, looking at uh, the Russian data set and the similar uh, number of Iranian um, posts, we had to collect our own uh, real, quote unquote, real data set uh, from trusted, uh, more reliable sources. We did that. Uh, we went out and collected um, a similar data set, similar time periods uh, from uh, these newspapers. To filter the um, huge data set down into something a bit more manageable, um, the team removed clutter. This uh, clutter is um, in, within the original data set um, and it's designed to um, engage with users on uh, benign topics such as uh, sports, uh, stories about TVs, movies, um, sayings, um, and sometimes just uh, random conversations or pieces of conversations that don't really mean anything. This is designed to confuse us as uh, readers, as humans, and also to um, dis disguise the underlying disinformation that uh, is within these uh, feeds. A single feed will have a lot of, say, news things um, in it, uh, sports, et cetera, and then some disinformation uh, thrown in. The user will read the sports, say, yes, I, I like this, uh, this makes sense. And then we'll get to the disinformation pieces and engage with those in the same fashion, knowing that they already like this um, feed based on the the flack, the, the other clutter that is there just to hide the disinformation. We, this is something that we needed to separate in order to be able to build uh, the um, our AI models that um, we built. And I present, or um, well, I uh, present uh, some of the topics uh, that uh, were hiding the disinformation that was removed as clutter. After the clutter is removed, uh, that is how we got the forty thousand pieces. So to sort of summarize and to get, provide an overview of the entire system, uh, we got a lot of data from Twitter. And we separated out uh, two data sets from it, um, a 40,000 Iranian data set and a 40,000 uh, Russian uh, data set, essentially tweets uh, produced by these two different countries that was identified by Twitter as uh, part of a disinformation campaign. We then collected our own um, real data for training purposes. This data set was um, then bundled with uh, the disinformation and then um, models were built, computer models were built uh, to, dis to distinguish these two things. 
these two different data sets. So we have a model for the Iranian uh, disinformation and we have a model for the Russian disinformation. We applied uh, six uh, machine learning models to this. I'll uh, talk about the accuracies of all of these, but I uh, do want to go through them um, very quickly one by one. Decision trees will take a data set and we'll come up with some rules um, such as uh, a specific hashtag or a specific emoji or a word. Uh, if it exists, uh, then um, this way. If it does not, then this way. So in a sense, it takes the entire data set and based on this condition, it splits the data set into two, one having that condition and the other not. And it applies these um, criteria all the way through until it gets down to a very pure sample. We take a sample, 40,000 this and 40,000 this, and that's a 50-50 split. And eventually each um, split point creates a purer and purer set of either real information or disinformation. Then we can take this uh, set of uh, conditions and it becomes a rule that we can use to distinguish real from this information. The benefit of this is um, all of these conditions are easily understood by humans. And because of that, this model generates a very understandable model. So there are strong benefits to this uh, approach. We also applied uh, lip short text which um, is coming out of, uh, it's an algorithm coming out of the National Taiwan University. It is designed for specifically short pieces of text. And um, we have found it based on previous projects to be a very, very good um, tool for analyzing short pieces of text. And I'll talk about uh, the accuracies that uh, this produced, which uh, were surprisingly good. Liblinear also coming out of the National Taiwan University is a companion to lip short text. And uh, this uh, companion specifically focuses on classification. We also applied uh, more traditional uh, approaches like naive Bayes, uh, very statistical um, method. If uh, this is true, then this is true. Um, it's all probability based. Support vector machines uh, will take the entire data set and come up with complex um, ways of splitting that um, the end result is very similar uh, the data set is uh, pure um, as pure as possible but uh, this type of uh, splitting is uh, not at all understandable it's um, very complicated very high dimensional and um, it, it doesn't produce a non-understandable model TensorFlow uh, produced by uh, initially Google is a deep neural network where we uh, feed in the data and um, through this uh, neural network, uh, this, this neural network is constructed. Each of these uh, is given a specific weighting and um, we have found that in certain cases this produces a really, really good um, result but uh, the model itself is uh, impossible to interpret. So if uh, we're looking for in interpretable uh, models, then uh, the previous one, uh, decision tree is a good one. All of the others uh, essentially create black boxes or for all practical purposes, black boxes uh, that we can't look into. So we just have to take the result for granted. Then um, we, employed uh, tenfold cross-validation. Um, in a nutshell, what it means is uh, we split the data set into 10 pieces and we hide one of the pieces. We know what it is, uh, meaning we know each piece is whether this information or real information, but we hide, we remove that uh, from the uh, training. On the remaining 90% of the data, we train our models and this produces a model. Once uh, we have the model, we will feed this uh, test testing data set into it. We will see what the model predicts for each piece, and then we compare it to the known actual label. And in this fashion, we can calculate an accuracy for um, this fold, that um, specific run. We then um, hide a different 10% of the data set and 
then a second, uh, third 10% of the data set and iteratively we go through and we eventually hide every piece of the data. This gives us uh, 10 accuracies, which we then average uh, for the model. We measure uh, the standard ways of uh, classification. Uh, we calculate the true positive, um, the proportion of um, entries that is the model predicts as real and is actually real. False positive, um, the model predicts it as real, but is actually disinformation. So we, the, sorry, the model made an error. We also calculate precision, uh, recall. Um, I have the definitions here. These are uh, quite standard uh, things, uh, but at the end of the uh, um, process, um, we are most interested in um, identifying disinformation, so the true positive rate and the false positive rate. We ran it um, across six different machine learning algorithms, so um, I will go through all of them. This is uh, three. For random forest, uh, we noticed that um, it gave us a very good accuracy rate and um, a very small false positive rate. It was able to identify uh, real and disinformation uh, without making a lot of errors, which in this case, uh, it was a better than expected result. And for random forest, again, um, the benefit of this algorithm is that the model can be interpreted. And we, if something goes wrong, we can actually check to see why it happened. Naive Bayes is a black box. We can't really see into it. Um, but it would be nice to see into it um, because uh, the false positive rate was quite high, 17%. It made a large number of errors. It mispredicted 17% um, of the cases. For support vector machines, uh, it produced a surprisingly uh, good result. Uh, in the past, SVMs have uh, produced um, less than desirable results, but in this case, it was actually very, very good. For um, TensorFlow, the uh, Google algorithm, um, same idea, produced uh, very good results. Um, in the past, we've had issues with it sometimes uh, where it produced um, less than stellar results. But in this case, uh, it was actually quite good, making uh, very few errors. LibLinear, um, in the past, has performed uh, quite well. But uh, in this case, it was, um, well, compared to the others, it wasn't as good as uh, we expected it to be. The star here, and we have no affiliation with uh, this algorithm or its creators, but uh, the star here was uh, lip short text, and it identified almost um, perfectly the disinformation and misinformation um, misidentifying a very, very few pieces of text. For whatever reason, and again, we can't see into the model that it creates, uh, this uh, algorithm worked really, really well. Very quickly, uh, looking at the Russian data set, uh, same six algorithms. Um, the performance was very similar between the Russian da um, data and the Iranian data. The ordering was very similar. The performance was very similar. Uh, naive Bayes in the past, um, meaning the previous uh, result uh, was similar. It was um, probably the um, in the, that same ballpark, uh, plus or minus 1%. SVMs, uh, again, very similar to previous results. And the best result here was, uh, again, lip short text with uh, almost a 100% accuracy in uh, distinguishing between real and disinformation. We're not quite sure how or why it does so well. It's specifically designed for short pieces of text. And um, apparently, it, it does um, the job really, really well. So uh, to wrap things up, um, we took two data sets, a Russian and an Iranian one. Uh, we compiled uh, real pieces of data for, that correspond to those two data sets. We then trained uh, six algorithms to distinguish between disinformation and real information. And um, 
in um, almost all of the cases, uh, we got really, really good accuracies in excess of 90% um, with um, one algorithm, lift short text, performing almost perfectly. When um, I say almost perfectly, 100% or very close um, to it, uh, accuracy in um, this type of scenario is worrisome, meaning that uh, the algorithm is not something went wrong and it's an error. But uh, we have seen uh, very similar accuracies um, by the same algorithm in uh, very different uh, data sets, in very different scenarios. And um, although it was the near perfect uh, result was um, somewhat of a surprise, it was, uh, we expected it to perform really well. Where this is going is um, we, have been working on this for quite a while, um, say two years, just in the context of the, um, hostile uh, disinformation, whereas previously we've looked at uh, disinformation in other contexts. But um, where this is heading and uh, where we're hoping to uh, end up very soon is um, essentially a, an automated package that um, scrapes content from social media comparing this information and real information, making predictions um, and identifying this information uh, content on the fly, uh, looking through as uh, many um, posts as possible, flagging this step of uh, disinformation and then highlighting it for um, an end user to interpret so they can identify these um, hostile actions uh, before they get ingrained um, and part of the regular narrative. So that is it. Um, you have now seen a qualitative angle uh, looking at all of the narratives. And um, I just talked about um, how we are working towards automating this process. I um, would like to take any questions. Uh, I will stop sharing my screen so we can um, focus on the questions. Thank you. I think the way it works is uh, Michael is supposed to send me questions in the chat and I'm supposed to field them. Um, I'm waiting for, um, for those questions now. If there are no questions, okay. Uh, can we measure the effectiveness of these narratives and techniques in shaping public opinion? Someone to tackle that? I can tackle that if you like. That's uh, probably the most difficult part of the equation is to measure how it affects public opinion. Because, of course, if you go to people in the public and say the Russians did this and this and this during the 2016 presidential election where they uh, um, ad advanced the candidacy of Donald Trump over that of Hillary Clinton, were you influenced by that? They would all say, well, heck no, I wasn't because it's a, an embarrassing sort of thing. So it's a difficult thing to go and prove uh, conclusively. You can see some of the results by how elections go, like how Brexit went and how the U.S. Uh, 2016 election went, but you can't prove it conclusively. No, you have no control data uh, to compare to. Um, having said that, I do have a student uh, who is uh, trying to tackle that um, and somehow tease it out. So it is something that we are hoping to work with. Um, she hasn't got into it uh, just yet, but um, it's a very important question um, and we do need to deal with it. Okay, um, I, I don't have any other questions uh, fed to me by Michael. So. Okay, uh, just one second.
Okay. If um, so, second question: If you can't prove that it did anything, can governments justify counter narratives? Does anybody want to field that one? Yeah. Um, so there's a difference between seeing that there was an effect and then measuring that effect. Uh, we know, for example, in COVID, um, there were disinformation uh, campaigns uh, suggesting all sorts of different uh, bad things about uh, vaccines, which were then parroted by um, a lot of people here in Canada. We can't measure it, but we know it happened. Um, so just because we can't measure something, um, if we can see the effects of it, uh, I think that it justifies um, the deployment of counter narratives. I, I think one of the big questions here that people avoid is that the Russians, the Chinese, the Iranians can all make liberal use of our social media, of our Facebook, of our Twitter, of Instagram. People in China can't do that. People in Russia can't do that. If you post this kind of thing in Russia as a Russian national, you're in for a trip to the, the gulag or uh, something worse. If you do it in Iran, you can end up being uh, beheaded. If you do it in China, you disappear. Uh, there is no social media to speak of in China except state-controlled social media, the same as true in Russia, unless you call uh, uh, the, the Russia or Chinese created uh, social media, social media, but it's very tightly restricted. So, um, you know, that when we're talking about counter narratives and should we or shouldn't we, well, they're not allowed to have counter narratives there. Should we allow them to attack us because we don't fight back, because we're nice, because we're free, because we're democratic, because our social media is open, but nobody can say this sort of thing on their social media? Yeah, it's a valid point. Sarah May, you look like you wanted to say something, but your your uh, your microphone is not connected. <laughs> yes. Well, um, in terms of the idea of can we measure this, it's important to kind of specify that with our current projects, we cannot do an exact quantitative measurement. We cannot say by this many percent, it increased the likelihood of this happening. However, there have been a number of very effective and very wide studies that have shown that there is an increase uh, caused by exposure to disinformation and an increase in specific um, in people thinking the way the disinformation wants them to. So yes, we do see it anecdotally, but there have also been a number of quite thorough and quite large studies that do show this has a pretty significant effect. Some of these have been studies looking at it from the idea of like um, doing a kind of pre-test of people's attitudes, then exposing them to disinformation, then doing a post-test of the attitudes to the same topic. Some have been more general, like we said, you know, kind of the survey type of thing. But we definitely do see that this has an effect. And I would say, given that we know it has an effect, we don't need to measure exactly how big it is um, in order to try to counter it. I'm waiting for the next question. Um, we'll see what happens. Okay, um, according to Michael, um, 
that's it. There, there don't seem to be any more questions. Um, so we're good to move on. In which case, um, thank you, Karnvir and Sarah May and Barry for uh, attending. Oh, uh, see you later. Okay, um, so again, uh, thank you. Uh, we'll move on to the second topic. Um, Cecilia Noel uh, will uh, present uh, their work on uh, finding or looking in, studying and analyzing uh, indicators of uh, human trafficking. Hi, so I guess I can do my study first. I'll just share my screen. Hey. So you're you can see it? Slide. Yes. It's good. Okay, I yes. will start. So I'll just start with a quick introduction. Hello, everybody. My name is Noelle Workington, and I am a current PhD student at Simon Fraser University, where I work with Dr. Richard Frank. And today I'm just going to be going over a study that I conducted with him called Hidden in Plain Sight, using contact information to identify traffickers in online ads. All right, so currently sex trafficking is a $150 billion industry affecting approximately 20 million adults and 2 million children internationally. And in Canada, most victims are Indigenous women and girls, as well as foreign female workers with pre precarious working visas. Uh, victims are controlled by traffickers and suffer psychological, physical and sexual abuse. And if they do get out, they suffer multiple complex traumas because of these abuses. And within Canada, there were 87 cases of human trafficking that were prosecuted between 2014 and 2017. And of the 87 prosecuted cases, 92% were charges with domestic sex trafficking. So of 223 sex trafficked victims in Canada, 81% were domestic. So we're seeing that the, the majority of these individuals are Canadians. They're not being trafficked in from different countries and crossing the border here. So with technological advancements, traffickers have made the shift online to recruit and to sell their victims. And since sex workers have also shifted online, traffickers use this to their advantage by pretending their victims are sex workers. And then it's difficult to tell the difference between the ads of escort workers and sex traffic victims. And traffickers are also able to sell younger victims easier as ages are not readily apparent. So they are able to evade law enforcement and reach a broader audience of clients. Also, buyers feel protected from the perceived sense of anonymity being online. And due to jurisdictional boundaries, law enforcement has a, a really difficult time identifying and then prosecuting these cases as websites can be hosted in different countries. Um, there is also a lack of accountability for internet service providers in what is posted to their site. So it's really hard to hold them accountable and to get them to you know, take care of this issue within their sites. So there have been various ways that have been used to identify trafficking online, and it's hard to differentiate between traffickers and sex, sex workers like I had previously mentioned. So some have used text analysis where they read through advertisements to identify textual indicators. Others have used machine learning to detect trafficking online after training with specific indicators. And still others have used phone numbers to track the movement of, of suspected traffickers online through posted locations and area codes as moving around to lots of different locations could potentially indicate organized crime. And still others have used phone numbers to match ads with co-occurring numbers and different descriptions, which is actually similar to what this current study has, we have done in this current study. So this current study, we were interested in identifying trafficking ads online in Canada 
we wanted to identify different types of contact information. So emails, phone and WhatsApp numbers, as well as social media handles. And then we want to compare the advertisements with co-occurring contact information with descriptions of the individuals within the ad. So if there are multiple ads that have the same phone number and then different descriptions, this could potentially indicate that one person is controlling the contact or the contact and sale of multiple individuals and thus this could potentially be sex trafficking. So LeoList was used as a large Canadian classified site for data capture. So they have a personals category with subsections for escorts. And using a customized web crawler, we scraped information from over 198,000 advertisements in the personals category up until September 10th of 2022. So we then use Python coding to extract contact information from the scraped data. So this isn't the, the whole code that's up here. This is just the regular expression used for each type of contact information. So phone numbers um, and WhatsApp numbers were collected together since the code captured these two together. Like they didn't, it didn't separate it out between a, a, what's a phone number and what's a WhatsApp number. And we also identified lots of ads with contact numbers hidden behind click to view captchas. So we decided to capture these since there were so many and they could potentially prove useful. But the only thing is that for these specific click to view numbers, so while there could be or well, while they could be organized according to the last four digits of the number, that was the only number that was um, viewable. We did have to manually access the URL of the ad, like go onto the actual ad, complete the CAPTCHA, and then view the number to confirm that the entire phone number or WhatsApp number series um, was a true matching number so that we weren't just assuming that based on the last four digits that they were the same because that would not necessarily be true. And then with these data sets containing extracted contact information, we then use criterion sampling to capture only groups of advertisements with matching contact information. And then for the first round of coding, we separated groups into one of two deductively chosen codes. So it's either potential trafficking or agency. And we relied on physical characteristics to differentiate individuals, not necessarily the names or the ages as these could be easily lied about. Um, so if there was one individual advertised in an ad and the characteristics of that individual with the same contact information differed, they were coded as potential trafficking. And then if there were multiple people listed in one ad, they were coded as agency, since this could be a spa or a massage parlor or an escort agency. And then for the second round of coding, we wanted to differentiate those coded as agency that might actually be trafficking disguised as an agency. So we conducted a keyword search within these ads using 50 terms known to be associated with trafficking. And then we use criterion sampling to identify those groups that have at least two advertisements with three or more trafficking keywords found. And then these contacts were then recoded as potential trafficking or agency. So following the second round of coding, we would then have two main codes for our analysis, and this is potential trafficking and potential trafficking or agency. So these are just the results of how many groups of each type of contact information were coded as potential trafficking and potential trafficking or agency. So overall, there were between two and 1100 ads for each of the groups of contact information. Unfortunately, the regular expression that we used was not able to, um, or was only able to extract eight email addresses in total of the entire data set. So these were not used. Most of the time, posters try to hide um, their email with spacing or different characters that the, regic, the regular expression did not cannot catch. So gathering email addresses could be something we could work on in the future. Um, and with the time restraints of conducting the study, I wasn't able to find different ways of capturing these addresses, unfortunately, but again, hopefully that's something we can work on in the future. All right, so this is just an example of the comparison of different descriptions within advertisements with matching phone numbers. So as you can see, the phone numbers are in red at the bottom, they're the same. And in one ad, the person is five foot three, 116 pounds, which is bolded. In the other ad, the person is five foot five and 135 pounds. So it sounds like they're describing two different individuals. And this is for the phone and WhatsApp numbers. Then for the social media handles, um, this is an example of comparing the two. As you can see in red, it's the social media handle to same between the two. And then in one ad, the person is 
five foot seven, blonde hair, green eyes. And in the second ad, they were five feet and petite. So again, different, very different descriptions of individuals. And then we have the click to view numbers. So this is another example of a comparison of different descriptions. Um, so you can see the phone number. I didn't go back in and add in the, the full number for the click to view that's still in red, but these were identified previously as having the exact same phone number. And as you can see in one ad, the person is five foot three, 105 pounds. In the other, they were five foot one hourglass figure. So just these three examples that I have shown you just go to show that there are different descriptions of individuals and yet they have the same contact information. So it could be potentially trafficking in that sense. All right, so moving on, there were some limitations to conducting this study. So some people may be willingly sharing the same contact information in their advertisements. So it, it is difficult to identify cases that we can state with 100% positivity that they are sex trafficking. Uh, also, others coded as potential trafficking or agency um, could indeed actually be an agency or a spa or massage parlor that just happened to contain those keyword indicators of trafficking, right? So it's, again, not 100% sure if they are actual sex trafficking ads. And as mentioned previously, we weren't able to capture email addresses in this study. So this is also something that we'd like to address in the future study. And lastly, we only scrape data from one classified site. So results could differ if we look at other sites, perhaps there are less found or perhaps there are more. It would be a good idea to address other sites in the future. Um, but finding different types of co-occurring contact information, such as social media handles, phone and WhatsApp numbers was a novel approach and does seem useful. Um, it could also be useful in the instances where there are limited textual indicators but this would still need to um, use a keyword search of indicators in some circumstances, just in the cases where there may be an agency or spa or massage parlor or that type of thing. But overall, this could potentially be built into an automated tool that gathers ads with matching contact information to help identify potential trafficking advertisements in real time. And yes, thank you. Thank you, Noel. Um, can we switch, um, Cecilia, can you go and then uh, we'll do the questions at the end? Sure, sure. Um, I'll just share my screen and... Yep. Nice. Thank you. Can you see? Yep. Awesome. Um, so I guess I will just um, wrap up the um, today's um, and our panel of the presentations. And uh, very similar to Noel's uh, research, I also did a study uh, focusing on um, online analysis of uh, advertisements of sexual services. Um, so I conducted a study named 100% independent or not. Uh, to try, trying to take a closer look at these online advertisements. Um, so before we get into the details of my study, um, I think it's uh, important to go through some of the, the basic stuff. So according to the government of Canada, trafficking in general is referred to the recruitment, transportation, harboring and or exercising control, direction or influence over the movements of a person in order to exploit the person, typically through sexual exploitation or forced labor. So put in short, many has actually put it the emphasis uh, saying that the uh, trafficking overall is a modern form of slavery, which individuals were recruited and controlled by their traffickers. And this is also a phenomenon occurring transnationally and domestically, meaning individuals within Canada who are born and raised in Canada may also be susceptible of being trafficked and uh, exploited. So according to uh, United Nations 2020, <laughs> Global report of uh, on human trafficking, 50% of the detected victims were trafficked for the purpose of sexual exploitation in 2018, with majority of the victims being female. 
This is very similar to some of the statistical data reported in Canada on human trafficking. Among all trafficking cases reported to the police, 86% are uh, occurred in metropolitan areas or in city centers. When trafficking cases involve some of the other offenses, many of them were associated with sex trade. And for detected victims, 96% of them are female and 4% of them are male, with majority of them are um, quite young when they're being trafficked. And lastly, there is also this issue of overrepresentation, but the under investigation of the indigenous victims in Canada. However, this is only a very small fraction of the statistics on trafficking here in Canada and globally, because we have not yet taken into account many of the underreported or unreported cases. So the internet and the sex trade is now becoming a very deeply intertwined issue with each other, particularly as the network technology is acting as a facilitator for sex trafficking. In particular, the internet is being abused by traffickers as the facilitator to either look for or to lure vulnerable victims or being used to distribute internet sex ads trying to attract their clients. Some of the common platforms often misused by traffickers include uh, classified advertising sites, social media platforms, or some of the private web pages that the traffickers or um, um, escort agencies would create to distribute information about their um, the girls available. The use of internet and other technologies also uh, obscured the ability for law enforcement investigations in many cases. Um, for example, there's always been this debate on the uh, issue of jurisdictions for investigations when uh, a lot of the websites are actually housing their trafficking ads um, in servers located in countries either lenient on sex trade or exploitation or are in states uh, who are not willing to share data during investigations. So um, this will obviously make investigations a bit more difficult. And there's also the issue uh, with anonymity as traffickers can easily get away from investigations or tracking by abandoning their pseudonymous accounts. So knowing that the internet platforms are being used by traffickers to facilitate their criminal behavior and that a lot of sex ads are being posted in different platforms, my study thus aims to explore some of the information that may indicate or to help distinguish between those ads and services posted and provided by escorts and those provided by potential sex trafficking victims. <laughs> Um, data source for the current study came from this Canadian classified platform called LeoList, uh, which is an advertising platform for free. And uh, all data available in this personal ad section, uh, as shown in this screenshot, um, were collected up to September 10th, 2020, 2022, were captured using a Python coded web crawler. This data, uh, this date was the cap date of which the data collection finishes and the analysis has started. The two main sampling methods used uh, for my study is random and criterion sampling, which we'll go into a bit more detail in the next slide. So um, the figure in this slide indicates a, a slightly more detailed version of the data selection process, which is why it looks a little complicated, uh, but uh, to put it in a uh, like easier way, criterion sampling was being conducted in two stages. And in the first stage, it was done prior to the random sampling, where I composed a list of general keywords and phrases that may have indicated sex trafficking to help narrow down our data set. And uh, those with only one or two keywords, uh, which were kind of considered uh, low in the possibility of being engaged or involved in sex trafficking or being excluded from the data set. And then a random sampling uh, occurred where a data was um, extracted uh, with 500 of the keywords where I will focus on analyzing them. And after the random sampling, uh, the second round of criteria sampling occurred. And in this stage, advertisements containing only partial information, such as the ad, some ads that were uh, modified after data capture, which uh, the crawler cannot capture the full advertisement or the updated version anymore, 
or those with only very generic information, such as uh, some of the ads were only body statistics or very basic descriptive terms, such as a mysterious blue eyes, uh, busty or curvy body, where there's no textual detail indicating the individual status uh, will be excluded. And the content must also be um, in English or at least contain English so that I can uh, proceed to a detailed analysis. And after a full uh, scraping of the data um, and um, white, um, a final sample contained 425 advertisements and a thematic content analysis using a grounded theory approach was then uh, used for detailed coding. So um, I conducted four rounds of inductive coding and I uh, was able to break um, the advertisements into two major themes, escort service ads and suspected trafficking ads, uh, with each of them containing four sub-themes or four categories of information that's useful. So advertisements posted by escorts um, predominantly contain some sort of restrictions or requirements toward their clients. These um, include the types of services, the types of calls, clients' ethnicity, or contact methods, such as the quoted advertisement presented here. Many also demanded health or hygiene to protect themselves and that they only provide safe play and often refuse bareback or unprotected sex. Escorts also have some expectations of pricing and respect. Many demanded to be contacted with only ser uh, with serious increase and that price is fixed and there is no negotiation with low ballers. Many escorts are very strict that they don't want low ballers um, and they have a uh, relatively higher pricing for their services. And Additionally, as service providers, they're also expecting to be treated very gently, equally, and respectfully. For suspected trafficking ads on the other side, um, descriptions of a wide variety of girls range with different nationality, body figures, and personalities were often being displayed, suggesting the individual or the trafficker may have a lot of girls that are under their control. The girls were also being described as being very open-minded to the extent that they're willing to provide an unrestricted scope of services to a variety of individuals. These girls can often provide services including risky behavior or behavior causing bodily injury, um, such as unprotected sex or sometimes BDSM services. Ads posted by suspected traffickers may often use the sense of newness or long available hours as a promoting component to attract their customers. The newness refers to situation where the girls are either staying for a very short term and that they will relocate days after, or in some situations, the girl is new in the location or the industry. High, availab uh, high availability on the other side uh, refers to uh, either a 24 seven service or in cases of uh, massage parlors, they will have long business hours of oftentimes 12 or more hours a day and seven days a week. This research obviously um, has some limitations yet to overcome. First, um, there's only, uh, there's this time restraint, which uh, when I was conducting this study, I was only able to pull 500 random sample um, for detailed analysis, and it will be better for future analysis to increase the sample size and, 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 and to actually analyze more advertisements. And the validity of the content may also raise an issue. As for content analysis, uh, we are actually really just trusting the posted content to be valid and genuine. So by including all of the posts, posts uh, on Leo list for analysis, issues may emerge when uh, we include a lot of the false advertisements uh, some of the false advertisements, and we might uh, miscategorize advertisements um, included and mistakenly identifying them as suspected trafficking when it's in fact just providing legitimate agency or escort services, or that they're just randomly posting fake ads for some other reasons. 
Um, but this research did show that there are some district, uh, there's this different textual details that might present for advertisement that look like um, that's providing escort services and those that's susceptible of um, traffic, human trafficking. So for future research and for policy implications, uh, some of the recommendations that I can provide based on the study is that um, it would be interesting to provide uh, uh, to see if we can conduct some cross platform analysis in the future so that similar analy uh, analytic method can be applied toward a variety of sex advertising platforms and we're able to refine and discover more indicators. And um, we should also call for international collaboration between the eight law enforcement agencies for more effective and efficient takedowns and investigations particularly since since many of the online platforms are hosting these ads um, often in places where the service and countries out are outside of the area where the original investigation started. For example, I believe Leolist servers were actually located in Budapest, which is outside of Canada's jurisdiction. And by pushing international collaboration, better and more efficient investigations will take place. And lastly, it is important to provide education to young individuals on, on human trafficking to tell them or to teach them some of the common scams used by traffickers and how to identify and protect themselves so that we are somehow more proactive in deterring trafficking to occur in the first place. And uh, that's everything for my presentations and I guess um, Will Noel and I can start take on uh, questions uh, related to this on uh, the topic of sex trafficking and online advertisements. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Cecilia. There are a couple of questions uh, that uh, I've been given here in uh, the chat. So the first one: uh, What additional work is required for the detection tool to be used by online advertising platforms to detect trafficking? I definitely think that we need to use it on more platforms first, like on different sites, just to, you know, make sure that we're identifying the sites, like the actual trafficking ads, like that cross over to the different platforms, like Cecilia was talking about previously. And I think we need to definitely refine how we're getting the, how we're writing the code for the capturing the email addresses, because I think that's really important. There were, there are going to be email addresses on there. There were eight that we identified, but as we know from previous research, people obfuscate the, these email addresses within the ads. And so they, you know, they hide them, they use these specific techniques, so we can't capture them. And I think we really need to work on that first before we can think about creating some sort of tool that can be useful for capturing all of this information. I hope yeah. that answers it. <laughs> And I think social media handles and um, textual analysis where indicators are being identified can definitely be used in um, the development of like deep learning or machine learning tools where um, we can kind of automate in a way that um, uh, the systems or computers can start autom automatically detecting some of the suspected uh, trafficking advertisements, which kind of just warns the law, invest, uh, law env enforcement with um, some information about these individuals who might be in the trafficking ring, which um, they can then start investigation. Okay, um, just as a bigger context, um, Barry, who's still online, and um, I've done some other work um, towards building an automated tool or um, the online detection. Um, so um, what you presented on both Cecilia and uh, Noel um, would could feed into that uh, quite nicely. In the past, um, for an online tool, we did look at uh, some other indicators. Um, I would say you looked at it in uh, much more depth um, or at least those two uh, aspects of it. Um, but um, overall, in the past, uh, when we did, did sorry did uh, these um, machine learning um, exercises, uh, the we got quite good accuracies uh, for distinguishing uh, between human trafficking and uh, regular advertisements. With uh, your results, uh, that would um, improve the accuracies. So th this online detection tool is uh, quite doable. 
um, it just needs to be calibrated, which is where um, your work would fit in really nicely. Is there bear anything to add? Yeah, well, one would be just a question of how are you two, I, I know you're using slightly different definitions. How do you distinguish between what you call sex trafficking and what others would call consensual sex work? Because you keep running up against that where you have organizations out there saying, keep your hands out of this. This is our business. Uh, we don't want governments uh, tracking us or telling us what we can do. And uh, then you've got other people saying that these uh, are, uh, many of these are sex tra trafficking victims. So how do you make that distinction? I think it's really difficult to identify all of the instances where it's definitely an escort, or an agency or service, or definitely sex trafficked victim. But just with this technique that I used, just because they have the same contact information, but different descriptions of girls within these advertisements, it could potentially mean that they are being trafficked because like, why would like three or four or five or 10 different girls all share the same phone number, but it doesn't say anything about sharing a phone number in the ad. Like, oh, we all share this. You can go to this specific person or anything like that, right? They're not stating that it's not known anywhere. So that's why it's potentially like one person is in charge. They're making the ads. They have these different girls and they're trafficking them. But that's just through my like the technique that I had used for the study that I Richard and I had conducted. But yeah, it's hard to it's really hard to say. Yeah, and it it, it kind of adds on to Noel's. I I started my um, analysis also thinking like, okay, how would I actually distinguish? But the more advertised I read, uh, there's actually slight distinguishments. Like I can actually see that some of the uh, individuals who are actually um, providing independent escort services actually have really strict restrictions where um, some of the girls that might be suspected of being trafficked are um, like, like you all, sh you are like shocked by how like the variety of the um, services they're able to provide and the hours of operation they're able to conduct. And there is like, I think it's these slight, this like, differences between the advertisements within the textual details um, that helps me to kind of identify, okay, these are probably the independent um, escorts and uh, the other ones are, or the escorts may be working for agencies, but the other ones are um, more going toward this like mm -hmm. suspected or suspicious trafficking related services. And because uh, even for agencies, some of the agencies are actually putting the um, the escorts requirements, and um, these agencies were actually uh, posting advertisements for the escorts, but they are also having restrictions. So I think restrictions or the demands or um, respect demanded by these escorts are um, very important um, mm -hmm. things for us to distinguish between a legitimate escort or uh, work that's willingly provided by the individual and the ones that's not really willing to provide the kind of services. But again, there's um, always this issue of false, false positives, but I don't think it is, uh, uh, it's because these false positives, we are not going to like, like what Barry said, like, okay, and we should not be touching on this area because um, there is trafficking and there's sex related trafficking. Um, and this is an issue going on and we shouldn't be like not trying to explore or uh, to this like to identify those online just because oh we might encounter some false positives. I think it's really it's still important to research and to identify those. Yeah. To, to clarify, I didn't say that we shouldn't be touching on it. I I study the subject. Uh, the the question keeps coming up when you talk to the police or law enforcement or anybody who's involved in it how do you how do you make these distinctions um do we say that all uh female or male or whatever uh, sex workers who have a pimp are sexually trafficked or do some of them avail themselves of a pimp or would they still consider themselves to be consensual sex workers it's a very tight distinction to make it so how do you get that so, and of course, it's one that confounds the police, because if you go in and you say we're going to bust one of these escort agencies or one of these massage parlors, 
if you get a bunch of people that are saying we're doing this consensually and they're all of a, a legal consenting age, there's not much that police can do, whether it's in Budapest or Vancouver or uh, New Orleans. They're still confronted with the same problem. They don't have a, a legal complainant. Just things to think about. You're still there, Richard? Yeah, um, looking for questions. Um, so there are a couple more questions uh, here that Michael has, uh, in the meantime, um, provided. Uh, are there any ethical or legal considerations that come into play when using contact information to identify potential sex trafficking victims? I mean, the, the contact information is shared publicly. Like, I didn't have to create an account to go on to this site. So I wouldn't see there being an ethical consideration and I'm not using the contact information is just for research and I'm also not publishing specific phone numbers right like I showed in the presentation but yeah I it's it's hard to say I don't think there would be but I think other people could have different opinions on that can I jump in there in defense of Noel and say that the tri-council policy on research says that this kind of information that's uh, posted in a public domain that's publicly accessible where they're trying to reach as many people as they can is is uh, basically fair game for researchers we might have ethics about sex research because somehow we have morals about that but uh, people post all sorts of things in public domains and uh, um, the the information is accessible to law enforcement agencies and to researchers that for example, the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers publishing on their Facebook pages about uh, their planned uh, assault on the U.S. Congress because they didn't agree with Donald Trump losing the election. Uh, that's what well, we didn't expect people to read that. Well, then don't post it in a public domain. Fully agree. Um, anything um, on the open, openly accessible on the internet, I think is a uh, fair game for uh, research and understanding the problem and you're not I, you're not disclosing this uh, contact detail anyway so um, just drawing um, higher level conclusions out of the out of the analysis okay um, another question uh, what strategies can be employed to ensure the safety and privacy of both potential victims and investigators when gathering information from online ads For investigators, um, neither, no one here created any accounts. Um, if uh, we're looking at just an online um, safety, then um, maybe the uh, expected uh, virtual private network or a VPN um, to be used, and uh, maybe as a um, lockdown disposable machine that um, it can be wiped or a virtual machine, um, so not your own personal PC if you're uh, doing this investigation as part of the police. But those uh, standards would apply no matter what sort of investigation you're doing. If you're in law enforcement, those are given. If you're, if you're of, law uh, enforcement, it's part of your job, right? Yeah. Yes. You, if, you, if you don't like doing those kinds of investigations, maybe you should be on a different uh, investigation team because you're going to inevitably end up having to look at that kind of material and deal with those sorts of victims and those sorts of offenders as well. Yes. In terms of safety and privacy for potential victims, any comments on that? I mean, I think the research in general is to try to help potential victims. So we, yeah, I, if the investigators, like the actual, like, um, if the actual law enforcement, where they would have to take over, like as investigators, as researchers, we can't do anything for the victims, the potential victims. We can only ever hand this information over to law enforcement and they would take over. So hopefully they would handle that appropriately and in a way that wouldn't cause any further harm to the victims. But like, yeah, I don't think there's much that we can do that would actually bring them harm or prevent harm from them. But yeah. Isn't it fair to say that uh, to 
almost the nth degree the actual identity of the victims is being anonymized by the people that are uh, marketing their services the traffickers they don't identify the actual person and where they are and uh how to go and get them because otherwise they'd, they'd be uh, drawing a, a clear path for law enforcement to go in there and do it. They sort of uh, generalize it and uh, they they use symbols or code words, but they don't um, say, here's this victim, come and come and get them. They try and anonymize it as much as they can and, and anonymize their own identity while they're at it. Talking about the traffickers here, they anonymize the actual names and identities of the victims and actually try and anonymize their names and identities as well. Yes. I think this leads into the next question. Um, is this going to be a cat and mouse game? Yeah, is this going to be a cat and mouse game? Well, go ahead. <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, so I'll take the first uh, shot. The research that we're doing here, um, I, I think, will highlight some of the key differences between people who are trafficked and people who are doing this um, on their own. And just like with any other research, uh, if we're studying a population that is trying to hide, if we look for ways of discovering them, um, they can read about it and use those to then hide better. And this is true for all sorts of different domains. Um, so in a way, yes, uh, this is likely going to become a cat and mouse game. If we discover that uh, X is a good way to uh, determine whether someone is uh, being trafficked, then um, I would expect that uh, X is um, not going to be visible for uh, too long and eventually we'll need to find something else. Certainly, uh, I mean, I've, I've worked on this sort of thing for two or three years, and they're always changing the, the terminology they use or the symbols they use when uh, a certain symbol or be becomes too recognizable to the uh, law enforcement officials or whoever might be watching, they'll change it for another symbol. Or, but the, but the, the sort of features that they try to pull together that, that advertise victims of sex trafficking remain similar even though they keep changing the symbols and the language they're still getting at the the same basic underlying elements that make a victim of sex trafficking appealing to somebody who would take advantage of that noel and cecilia jump in and tell me i'm wrong <laughs> no i think you're right just from what i'm reading um i didn't read a lot this not um I haven't been in the research of sex trafficking for a long time, but um, I would agree, yeah. So like, um, there's still some of the fundamental stuff that the traffickers keep putting in these advertisements so that they can attract more clients online. It's it's always a very similar pattern. Yeah. They might develop in later times, but um, there there will be a trend that we can yeah. see. I think they moved from the the symbol of the cherry, which uh, symbolized something for all the the uh, potential consumers of this, to a a symbol of a, a a young blossom or something like that. But they're they sort of symbolize the same thing. They're just trying to stay as, ahead of law enforcement. But the people inside the community, the the purveyors and the purchasers, are understanding what those symbols mean, just like they will move from. Uh, newly arrived to fresh to whatever they maybe at one time they described them as young but that usually attracted the attention of the law enforcement right away so they they keep changing that a little bit it is but somebody said it's a it's a moving uh game it's like a game of whack-a-mole they'll keep trying to change it for sure yeah and even those changes in symbols can be viewed as a cat and mouse type of thing mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what do you think the risk of false positives are? Any thoughts? Um, I'm I'm assuming uh, false positive here refers to regular 
people being identified as victims of human trafficking, but we can also interpret it uh, vice versa as false negatives. This is a good question for Noel or Cecilia. Yeah, I was just I was just thinking, trying to put it into words. I think that for false positives, like the a negative situation that could occur because of that, like if a, an actual escort was like flagged as being a sex traffic victim, then they might have to deal with obviously if law enforcement is able to like track their contact information and like get a hold of them somehow, right? Then they would have to deal with that, which would be like a hassle for them and unpleasant, I can I can imagine. But I mean, in this type of scenario, when we're trying to really identify sex traffic victims, I think the benefits of like identifying even just a few sex traffic victims and helping them outweigh the costs or the, the negative implications of potentially identifying false positives and going after an actual escort worker thinking they're trafficked because we want to get these victims like that's the goal we want to try to help them and if that happens to run into scenarios in which we you know somehow have those false positives and then these actual escort workers are contacted by law enforcement then i mean it just might be something that that occurs because I don't think there's ever going to be a scenario where we have like a hundred percent accuracy in identifying these cases. So it's better to just have these false positives and like, you know, those situations happen than to just miss any sex traffic victims in the first place. And kind of to add on to Noel stuff and I was just thinking about because I uh, was thinking about how sometimes um, some legitimate escorts or sex workers might have a um, might not have a good relationship with police uh, or law enforcement. So in addition to um, um, I would I also think that maybe the benefit somehow outweighs it because I think it's better to identify um, or to to just investigate or to ask whether they're actually um, being a victim or to confirm whether they're actually being a victim of sex trafficking than to ignore or to just kind of uh, we're in the other situation where we're misidentifying some of the potential victims as escort um, or, or just the, the legitimate or ind independent workers. But on the other side, I think it's also important for uh, law enforcement trying to kind of uh, establish like a trusting or a better create a better relationship or um, to communicate better with the legitimate escort workers so that they are um, more comfortable with communicating or to share information uh, with law enforcement because there might be um, some issues with communication or because uh, some um, sex workers might have really bad experience when they are used to work on the streets uh, where they had negative encounters with law enforcement and that they are really avoidant in um, providing information or to helping with the investigation, even just to just trying to confirm that, oh, they're just legitimate independent worker. Um, so I think in addition to the investigations on whether this on um, whether this independent this individual is in that court or a uh, trafficking victims, I think on the like on the site work, it's also very important um, to kind of help with um, to do a little bit about the relationship between the actual escorts and the law enforcement. I'm not sure whether I'm ask, answering the question, but I just kind of addition to what Noel was pr promoting. I think um, I think this is also very important. I'm just going to add one quick thing in there. I think uh, you have another question there, Richard. I have yeah, two more. It's okay. okay. So, I'll just, so I'll just say, fine for time. you know, it's it's almost impossible to get around those false positives because you you do have sex workers, uh, consensual sex workers, uh, advertising on the same site. So you're going to get some false positives. But uh, as as uh, Cecilia and Noel are saying, it's important to track down victims at the same time and to help them if you can. Yeah, sometimes the cost of a false positive is uh, negligible um, when compared to the benefit of a true positive. I would say that this is uh, one of those uh, scenarios. Um, another question, um, could it 
this, uh, what we're talking about, uh, drive legitimate workers to darker places on the internet? I, I don't think so, because if they're a legitimate worker, they're, wanna get, they're gonna wanna get business and not everyone knows how to access darker areas of the internet. And so to get more business, they're gonna wanna stay on the clear net, right? Where there's more accessibility to potential customers. And also um, they might not themselves know how to use or access deeper parts of the internet. So I really don't think it would affect them, but I could just be, yeah, that maybe that's what I think. Cecilia? Yeah, I think, I think as well, because, um, and especially for, um, I think for, if an individual want to access dark web, I think they might need computer, which maybe not a lot of the escort services will just kind of sit by a laptop or a computer, like all the time trying to get their uh, services. A lot of them prefer using phones, um, quick access methods. So that I don't think a lot of them will change into a darker or more secretive ways. And, um, and with a lot of people using internet or like phones or WhatsApp, um, I'm, I think a lot of the escort might prefer staying online where, and, and they also have like some sort of anonymity in a way where they're just, they can create an account with their fake names, with their actual phone number, um, kind of, it's some, some more, somewhat more um, safer than them working on the streets, trying to advertise or to attract clients. But at the same time, it's more convenient for them to get the clients when they're just online than going through um, all the hassle into the dark net. So yeah, I don't think it will be a big issue where they're going to, everyone's going to displace and go on to dark net all of a sudden. What, what I would add to that is, um, people that are searching for these kinds of services uh, are usually looking for some degree of instant gratification and going down a rabbit hole on the dark web and handing over your credit card information to somebody who you can't verify who maybe somewhere else in the world is not going to necessarily get that for you. So they're not looking for that sort of thing. So that 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 marketing edge where they're advertising the services, they're they're trying to get customers that want the services immediately not in some distant time and place this is uh, typical to um any community that needs um to be visible if you hide too well uh customers can't find you if you don't hide at all then uh, the police will find you uh, another question. Uh, this one uh, is related to Chat GPT. What impact do you think that Chat GPT or similar is having or will have on this space? I'll share one article I came across this morning uh, where a, I, I don't know, uh, a TikToker or an OnlyFans uh, person. Uh, was uh, starting to advertise a business or a side business where you can um, essentially be her boyfriend, uh, but the interaction would be driven by OpenAI's chat GPT. So you would interact with her, uh, but uh, the conversation uh, would be AI-based. And this costs you, it was going for a dollar a minute. So uh, new technology would definitely open up uh, new avenues for um, doing this um, or as a new business stream. My, my reaction to that is that we were talking here about sites like Leo List and advertising for adult escort services, which is really a, a euphemism for uh, something else. They're not looking to interact online with some artificial intelligence creature, they're act, uh, looking to uh, interact in real time in the real world uh, and, and pay for the service. I mean, there's like, I wouldn't say there's no services like that, but most of those services are not advertising um, uh, the opportunity to chat or imagine that you're doing it. They're offering the opportunity to do it. Mm -hmm. 
And I, I kind of, I was just thinking about, um, and also when creating the advertisements, even if and they use ChatGPT or use open like AI services, and um, and oftentimes these AI services might create like the perfect advertisement with perfect grammar and typos, which this might lead them into inf um, issues where the website might detect some sensitive words that might trigger the algorithm thinking uh, more likely to think that these are trafficking related. So, and oftentimes we're seeing advertisement using emojis or using different like numbers or uh, special characters trying to replace it so that they break the word um, to avoid detection. So I don't think open, like even if they create like the perfect grammar an advertisement using ChatGPT, they might have to still replace some of the words with special characters to avoid detection. So I don't think that would be like a big, big issue because they are eventually have to replace those um, like fresh young into something else anyways. For whatever it's worth, uh, sex sells. Uh, it drove DVD sales, uh, it drove uh, the um, internet uh, at the beginning. Uh, whatever technology humans invent, uh, they seem to use it for, for that purpose. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if someone finds a novel way of using ChatGPT for, um, for this purpose as well. Um, another question, uh, what is the role of the advertisement platforms in all of this? If they can detect trafficking, do they have a duty of care to do so? And at the moment, this is the last question. I mean, I think a lot of times, because if they're like the server is hosted in a different country, like with um, Leo Les hosted in Hungary, like how do you how do you get them to actually care about the issue and actually change something about it? I think there was, or I was reading an article when I was conducting this research about Craigslist, and they had this issue with sex, sex trafficking within their personals ads, and the only way they were able to get them to stop um, their personals ads. Like to like stop having that section on on Craigslist was to um, I think they shamed them through the media like they were posting it in news articles like oh Craigslist they're like really bad for sex trafficking it's everywhere and then Craigslist was getting all this bad attention and I think they have their own advertisers that like advertise within Craigslist so they were pulling their advertisements from Craigslist so Craigslist was now not making a lot of money right and because they're losing advertisements and so I think that's how they stopped running personals ads. And that was a few years ago. I don't think they've come back up with that problem. I'm not mm -hmm. sure, but I did read about that and that was an effective way to get them to stop. But otherwise it is pretty difficult, especially when it's in a different country and you don't really have control over what they do. But yeah, I don't know if somebody else has a different opinion on that. Well, I think the same, the same issue or question extends to Twitter and Facebook. How do you get them to police themselves? Uh, governments have been wrestling with it. The platforms themselves have been wrestling with it. Uh, you can't tell us what to take down. Well, if you don't take it down, we're going to regulate you. Uh, you know, once in a while they get in and regulate themselves. Now Twitter's being regulated by Elon Musk. Um, if, I don't know how, how many people have been following the fate of Twitter since he started uh, regulating it or self-regulating it, but you know, a, a lot of these platforms don't regulate themselves. They pride themselves on being um, open range or uh, free territory where uh, law enforcement doesn't, uh, doesn't have any applicability. We can do whatever we want, say whatever we want. And quite often, um, it's not in the platform's best interest to do anything about this. Um, it's in their interest to encourage as many advertisements, whatever they may be, uh, to be on the platform because the more the more popular uh, they are, the more advertisements. I'm, I'm thinking of uh, those click advertisements by legitimate businesses uh, they can sell uh, or whatever method they um, use to monetize uh, their platform. So they have a real disincentive to actually do this. Mm -hmm. I would say they have a moral incentive, but that's not a uh, commercial uh, reason. A moral responsibility is not necessarily the same thing as an incentive. Yeah. You have to feel the responsibility in order to feel the incentive. Uh, yes. 
No, um, public shaming will um, be a, a good incentive, uh, as what happened to Greg's list. Or um, uh, the other one, Backpage, uh, the owner being arrested. Yeah. Yeah, these are uh, caught, good, uh, good Like reasons. the owner of Silk Road? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's it for the questions. Um, any final thoughts? It's all good. Everyone happy? Okay. Um, in that case, uh, thank you very much um, for the discussions and the questions and for everyone else who submitted questions. Uh, they, they were quite good. And um, I think the discussion was uh, valuable. So that's it for us. Um, I think uh, we're good to drop off. Um, would uh, want to thank Michael for organizing this and being in the background uh, for support. And uh, also HAL 9000 for uh, just being there and observing us and learning and doing its uh, AI type of thing. So thank you very much.